This podcast contains language that some listeners might find offensive. White supremacists love talking to Evelyn Rich. Maybe it was her talent for flattery. All right, well, you better face around the other way. Because you sound like a kind of an interesting person, so maybe you better give me some background on yourself and how you got involved in this. Rich was born in England, and she was getting her PhD at Boston University. Her dissertation was on the modern Ku Klux Klan, what they believed and why they believed it. On February 17, 1986, she put her tape recorder in front of a neo-Nazi named Joe Fields. So how did you get into this? From the time I was probably four or five, I was attracted to national socialism. I used to watch these Hollywood movies and I'd, I'd root for the Germans, you know. Rich and Fields got together in Southern California at a conference hosted by the Institute for Historical Review. The IHR called itself a think tank, but it was really a hate group. Its main goal was to sow doubt about the Holocaust, to spread the lie that Germany hadn't really killed six million Jews. The doctoral student and the neo-Nazi wouldn't be alone for long. A few minutes into their conversation, they got interrupted by a knock on the door. She's probably the only one in my family who I can uh, really talk to. Things like that. Yeah, who is it? It was David Duke, America's best-known white supremacist. Oh, you're in a view. Yeah. yeah. You're in the middle of it. Can't get in our room. Oh, you were, oh the door's open. There you go. We're getting that way. Duke had grown up in New Orleans in the 50s and 60s. His father wasn't around much, and his mother was an alcoholic. As a teenager, he found a community at the New Orleans White Citizens Council, a group that fought to stop the integration of public schools. Duke got famous in the 70s, when he was a leader in the Ku Klux Klan. Reporters and TV producers thought he was a fascinating subject. He was well-dressed and clean-cut. He seemed like a perfectly nice young man, until he opened his mouth. The American white people are searching and are reaching out for a movement. And the Ku Klux Klan is that movement. White power! White power! White power! power! By the time he met Evelyn Rich, Duke was in his 30s, and he'd broken with the Klan. Duke couldn't resist butting into Rich's conversation with the neo-Nazi. When Duke spoke up, He made it clear that his worldview hadn't changed since he left the KKK. I think people generally deserve what they try to push on other people. I think they're Mm -hmm. trying to exterminate our race. I think probably in a moral sense, the Jewish people Mm -hmm. have been a blight. I mean, as a whole, not every Mm -hmm. Jew. And they probably deserve to go into the ash of history. The Jewish people have been a blight. They probably deserve to go into the ash bin of history. Behind closed doors, at this California meetup for Holocaust deniers, Duke felt comfortable sharing his true beliefs. And that wasn't all he revealed. A few minutes later, Duke talked about his master plan, his strategy for breaking into the mainstream by keeping quiet about his extremist views. I'm trying to bring new people in, in uh, like a drummer. And, but it's the difference when they can, if they can call you a Nazi and make it stick, I mean, tough, mm-hmm. real, real, really hard, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt the ability of people to open their minds to what you're saying. When Fields brought up Nazi Germany, Duke said the time was right for a new Fuhrer. It doesn't take that many people uh, to start something rolling. You know, Hitler oh, uh, started okay. with had seven men. Right, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying and to no say. No one to wanted you. it. Most people didn't want to have anything to do with it. Don't you think it can happen right now, put the right package together? Don't you think that there are millions of Americans who are alienated and looking for something, and the truth is the truth, and give them something to believe in? And Guru Duke will come along. Yeah. Well, that's so in me, somebody, my God, if it's not me, I'll, you know, I I might have to do it, because nobody else might come along and do it. The recording you just heard would help bring down David Duke. But that would happen later. In the late 80s and early 90s, Duke was sure his time had come, that he was the leader white people wanted to believe in. 
He was canny and charismatic. And in his home state of Louisiana, he was becoming a political star. As a kid growing up in New Orleans, there was a lot about Duke and his movement that I couldn't comprehend. But I saw and heard enough back then to understand that something enormous was at stake. There's something very scary about the election of David Duke. David Duke is drawing full houses. Much of the debate, at least at first, will be about David Duke. Some hate him. To others, he's a hero. This is Slow Burn Season 4. I'm your host, Josh Levine. Over the next six episodes, you'll hear about the moment when a white supremacist became an American political phenomenon. What were the forces that fueled David Duke's rise? What did it take to defeat him? And did he ever really go away? This is episode one, White Knight. David Duke had big plans and an enormous ego. His first priority in the years after he bared his soul to Evelyn Rich was to win the highest office in the land. If I have your commitment and you have my commitment that tomorrow, if I will announce my formal entry into the race for the Democratic nomination for President of the United States. Duke's 1988 presidential run was a flop. As a Democrat, he couldn't muster enough support to get on the debate stage. Duke then ran under the banner of the Populist Party, a fringe group dominated by Klansmen, Holocaust deniers, and avowed Nazis. In that 1988 race, George H.W. Bush beat Michael Dukakis by eight points. Duke would earn just 0.05% of the vote. Duke was undeterred by this electoral rout. He believed he had a great message, and that he was a great messenger. He would just need to take a different path to power. A month after the presidential race, the 38-year-old Duke found an opportunity that was within his grasp. He was going to run for the Louisiana State House of Representatives. This podcast is going to focus on a few pivotal years in Duke's career the period when he made his most successful run at real political power. I'm starting here with a campaign in the New Orleans suburbs because this was the race that changed David Duke's life. Before this election, in Louisiana's House District 81, Duke wasn't really a factor in state or national politics. But by the time the campaign was over, Duke was a sensation, and he was threatening to take control of the entire state And it all happened incredibly quickly. House District 81 was in the suburb of Metairie, in Jefferson Parish. Parishes, by the way, are what most states call counties. New Orleans is an Orleans parish. Yes, they're pronounced differently, for reasons it would take a whole other podcast to explain. The District 81 race was a special election. The seat came open when the guy who'd held it became a judge. It would be a lightning-fast campaign. The primary was in less than two months. Duke's opponents included a school board member, a florist, a bingo hall owner, and John Treen, who was best known as the brother of a former Louisiana governor. Any of those men could have ended David Duke's campaign before it started. Duke had been living just outside the district. If someone had challenged his residency, he would have been disqualified and it's possible no one would remember Duke today. But none of them raised a challenge. They didn't think Duke was a serious contender. Maybe they didn't understand District 81. Here's James Gill, who wrote about Duke for the New Orleans Times-Picayune. A very, very conservative is a polite word, um, 
If ever a, a Klansman or a Nazi wants to get into mainstream politics, you couldn't choose a better district than this one in Metairie. So it's tailor-made. District 81 included the neighborhood of Old Metairie, with its tree-lined streets and big mansions. It also included the working-class area of Bucktown, an old fishing village dotted with clabbered homes. District 81 had rich people and hard-up people and people in between, but almost all of them, 99.6% of them, were white. Most voters in the district were on the rolls as Democrats, but they'd started to cast ballots for Republicans in huge numbers. In his 1984 re-election campaign, Ronald Reagan got 84% of the vote in District 81. David Duke knew his audience. In this special election, he wouldn't be a Democrat or a populist. This time, he'd run as a Republican. On the trail, Duke touted himself as honest and outspoken. At times, as national news outlets pointed out, that outspokenness was more like straight-up racism. One big plank in Duke's platform, reforming the welfare system by curbing the illegitimate black birth rate. But Duke didn't mention the Holocaust. And when he got on the subject of race, he spoke more stridently than Ronald Reagan did, but mostly took the same positions. In fact, I'm trying to prevent discrimination with this idea, as I say, of eliminating quotas. We want workfare instead of welfare, and we want an absolute end to these anti-white programs of racial discrimination called affirmative action and minority set-asides. Duke presented white nationalism as an ideology of fairness. He argued that Black Americans were getting special privileges on the job market and in government contracting, and that it was time for someone to stand up for white people's interests. Here's Quinn Hillier, a Republican who supported Duke's opponent, John Treen. When he did talk about race, it was never about doing anything to blacks. It was always about protecting whites. Psychologically, for a lot of voters, these distinctions, uh, subtle distinctions, are important. Duke didn't only talk about race. One of his biggest issues was property taxes. He vowed to keep them low, to protect what he called hardworking, productive, middle-class people. This was the plan Duke had laid out to Evelyn Rich and the neo-Nazi Joe Fields. He was trying to bring new people in, to win over voters who didn't identify as white supremacists. To understand the district where David Duke was running, you need to know about the most powerful man in Jefferson Parish. He was a Chinese-American sheriff in a cowboy hat, and his name was Harry Lee. Here he is in a 2006 interview with NPR, a year before he died. The sheriff of Jefferson Parish is the closest thing there is to being a king in the United States. I have no unions. I don't have civil service. I hire and fire at will. In other words, I don't have to go to council and propose a budget. I approve the budget. I am the head of the law enforcement district, and the law enforcement district only has one vote, which is me. Lee was a fun-loving autocrat. At Mardi Gras, he threw Harry Lee dolls from a float that featured an enormous likeness of his own face. The sheriff spent $80,000 on that float, which he saw as money well spent. Every year, he said, my big fat head's coming down Veterans Highway and a half million, a million people see it. Harry Lee was born in New Orleans in 1932, in the back room of his family's laundromat. A bunch of Lee's constituents in Jefferson Parish had relocated from New Orleans, too. One of them was David Duke, who moved to Jefferson in the 1970s. White New Orleanians went to the suburbs in search of bigger houses and lower tax bills. They also wanted to get away from black people. Here's former New Orleans Mayor Mark Morial. His father was the city's first black mayor. What they were doing was getting away from integration, fleeing uh, what they thought the city of New Orleans was, was becoming, which was a city which was more racially diverse and where African-American numbers were increasing and African-American influence was increasing. As the population of Jefferson Parish swelled, 
Harry Lee presented himself as the guardian of the suburbs. He'd make sure that Metairie felt like a safe haven for white people. The sheriff faced a big test in 1986, when the parish was hit by a string of armed robberies. That December, he proposed a solution to the crime wave, racial profiling. He will be stopping more black people in predominantly white neighborhoods and in I don't know how to say it other than that we're going to do it. If you live in a predominantly white neighborhood and there's two black males in a car right behind you, there's a pretty good chance that they're up to no good. The executive director of the Louisiana ACLU called Lee a despicable bigot. Protesters descended on Jefferson Parish, demanding his resignation and chanting, Harry Lee and the Klan go hand in hand. Lee walked back his plan, but he didn't resign. James Gill covered Lee for decades. He would always say exactly what he thought, and what he thought was seldom politically correct, but often chimed with his constituents. Harry had that knack of getting away with stuff that um, other people couldn't, and people just loved him for it. Harry Lee's supporters thought he was being straight with them about the dangers of New Orleans and of New Orleanians specifically Black New Orleanians. Poverty, blight, and gun violence were real problems in the city in the 1980s. Here's Mark Morial again. Louisiana was experiencing a a deep, deep recession related to the the downward price of oil, which caused uh, uh, tremendous upheaval. It caused New Orleans to lose uh, population. It gave us a problem of abandoned housing. It fueled the, uh, the crime and the crack ep- epidemic in the city. In New Orleans, the economic catastrophe of the oil bust converged with the nationwide trends of white flight and urban neglect. The white suburbanites of Jefferson Parish, meanwhile, went to great lengths to keep their enclave sealed off. One incident in 1987 drew national attention. Finally this evening, we have a report about crime and race relations, and it may come down to which side of the fence you live on just outside New Orleans. To be specific, it's not a fence, and it's not a wall. It's a barrier. The Jefferson Parish Council ordered the construction of two steel barricades. Those barriers closed off a pair of public streets, blocking traffic from a black neighborhood in New Orleans. Parish officials said the barricades were to keep criminals from slipping in and out of their neighborhoods. But it's pure racism. This side of Jefferson is predominantly white, whereas this side of Orleans Parish is predominantly black. A New Orleans government crew bulldozed the barricades, and Jefferson decided not to rebuild them. But the message had been sent. Racism was a powerful force in District 81. The popularity of Harry Lee and the barricades constructed on the border with Orleans Parish bore that out. So did the rising street-level support for David Duke. Early polls had Duke in third place, with just 7% support. But James Gill was sure those numbers were bogus. He watched Duke stroll into a bar in Metairie and get received as a hero. He also saw Duke yard signs everywhere. And Gill thought all those signs actually understated Duke's popularity. People would, would be embarrassed to confess they, they were voting for Duke, but in the privacy of the voting booth, they would do it. Yeah. And on January 16th, 1989, five days before the primary, an incident in New Orleans made Duke's race-based campaign resonate more loudly in Jefferson Parish. At approximately four this afternoon, Martin Luther King Day on Canal Street turned ugly. Calls could be heard on police radios, trying to keep the crowds from building too thick. When they did, there were fights between blacks and whites. The police said the violence in downtown New Orleans stemmed from what they called turf wars between black youths. But some bystanders got caught in the middle. I saw a guy, an old guy, about 60, getting beat up. They came down here saying no whites on Black Street, on Canal Street. A couple of friends, 
hit him. Canal Street had been New Orleans' main shopping district. But by the late 1980s, it was blighted. Anyone who could afford to went shopping at huge malls a few miles away in Metairie. The violence on Canal Street was part of a larger story about disinvestment in American cities. But most people in District 81 weren't thinking about sociology. They wanted to keep New Orleans, and everything it represented, as far from their front doors as possible. The more scared they were, the better it was for David Duke. One of Duke's opponents, watching footage of the violence, told his wife, I think we're going to have some trouble with this. As voters in District 81 went to cast their ballots, David Duke was still considered an underdog. The frontrunner was 62-year-old Republican John Treen. Beth Rickey worked for the Treen campaign. Here she is in 1991. I came up the stairs that night, election night, and I'm coming up the stairs, and I was just waiting to hear that it was John and this other fellow, Delton Charles, in a runoff. And someone grabbed me and said, Duke came in first. Governor Buddy Romer says electing former Klansman David Duke to the state legislature would not help Louisiana's national image. Duke led Treen with 33% of the vote. David Duke was inching closer to the American mainstream, but he wasn't a winner quite yet. This was just the first round of voting. Since neither Duke or Treen had a majority, there would be a runoff a month later. In private, Harry Lee described the face-off between David Duke and John Treen as a choice between a bigot and an asshole. Republicans in Louisiana loved Treen's brother, Dave, the former governor. But John, who made his money as a home builder, was seen as entitled and arrogant. He was the type of guy, one anonymous Republican said, who can tell you good morning and piss you off. Treen had thought he could coast to victory on name recognition alone. When the race became a personality contest, he was severely outgunned. John Treen was um, not an impressive candidate. Um, I mean, he was a perfectly decent guy, as far as I know, but I had nothing really to commend him. He was no, no charisma, no, no color. No style, no dash. David Duke had the dash that John Treen lacked. Duke's fans reveled in his youth and his energy. Earlier in the 80s, he'd remade his face with plastic surgery, a nose job, chin implant, and chemical peels. One 72-year-old woman said that seeing Duke at her door was one of the most thrilling moments of her life. Treen voters tended to be the very richest in District 81, the type that belonged to Metairie Country Club. Duke's support was wider-ranging. Middle-class people, working-class laborers, retirees. And the people that liked him, they really liked him. Some voters are concerned about Duke's Klan connection, but a lot are not. You got my full support. I mean, I see nothing wrong with being white. Pro-white does not necessarily mean anti-black. And it doesn't bother you that he's a former Klansman? Uh, No. I think uh, there's skeletons in all of them. Here's Beth Rickey again. When I was on radio show one time, I got in a sort of a debate with this man who was saying, are you calling me a racist for supporting David Duke? And I said, why why are you voting for David Duke as opposed to, say, John Treen? And he said, well, David Duke's got credentials. And I thought, that's so true. You know, he's... They know he means business about welfare reform. He's a Klan leader. Treen himself was no great champion of civil rights. He'd once been a member of the segregationist states' rights party. But he said his views on race had evolved, and he drew a bright line between his values and David Duke's. I think he's running a very thinly veiled racist and anti-Semitic campaign. And this is his history that goes back in the, in the publications that he has uh, put out. One of Treen's campaign mailers showed Treen in his navy whites at age 19, serving his country during World War II. Alongside it was a photo of 19-year-old David Duke, dressed as a Nazi brown shirt. That image wasn't doctored. He really had worn a swastika. Duke knew this was bad for him. It was just like he'd said to Evelyn Rich three years earlier. If they can call you a Nazi and make it stick, it's going to hurt. Duke needed to make sure it didn't stick. Instead of apologizing, 
He played the victim. He called that flyer character assassination and made a show of tearing it up on local television. The race in District 81 came down to trust. Who was an honest broker and who was telling voters what they wanted to hear? For Duke and Treen, this was a fundamental distinction. You don't even know the definition of You're hypocrisy, such a hypocrite. I, I'm, I'm still standing up. For, I'm standing up for the white race. I don't. I don't deny that. I think that we you have. Know, you know the definition of hypocrisy. And, and you, know, you know the definition of hypocrisy. In private, you agree with practically everything I say, but you don't have no. the guts and the courage to come out openly and say what I believe. You don't have the guts and courage to tell the truth, and they do it. As the runoff drew closer the national media descended on District 81. Polls have predicted a close race between ex-Klansman David Duke and John Treen, both running as Republicans. Afternoon, election officials said it appeared between 75 and 80 percent of the voters in the district would go to the polls. This is the front runner. David Duke is 38 years old, smooth, articulate, a sharp dresser, and a former imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Republican leaders were horrified by Duke and by the prospect that he'd stay in the party's reputation. They saw the race in Jefferson Parish as an emergency. John has always worked for the traditional values and principles which you and I cherish. Ronald Reagan recorded a radio commercial for Treen, and President Bush sent a letter to voters in the district calling Treen the clear choice. It wasn't just national Republicans who lined up behind Duke's opponent the Louisiana Republican Party backed John Treen, too. Duke described these endorsements as outside interference. This is a, it's not only heavy-handed, it's, it's unethical. I'm just as, as much a legitimate Republican as John Treen or, or Reagan or Bush or any of these other people. David Duke positioned himself as the ultimate outsider, someone who understood what it felt like to be put upon and forgotten. The race in District 81, he said, was me against the world. But not every public official took a stand against David Duke. Sheriff Harry Lee had a special connection with his white constituents, a connection he'd built despite not being white himself. They saw Lee as someone who was genuine and who spoke the truth even when it got him into trouble. So it's possible that Lee could have tilted the election if he told Jefferson Parish voters that Duke was beyond the pale. Instead, Lee sat the race out. He didn't campaign for the bigot or the asshole. Here's James Gill. Harry must have felt he needed to tread very carefully because um, he didn't want to alienate people who might vote for him. And people who voted for Duke would also vote for Harry. On election day, Quinn Hillier posted up at the busiest intersection in District 81, the corner of Bonnebel and Veterans. There were maybe 10 or 12 of us for train that were at that intersection with our green train signs and 25 or 30 Duke people there with their blue and white Duke signs. And for a large part of that time, David Duke himself was there. Hillier, who was not quite 25 at the time, was active in the Louisiana Young Republicans. So were most of the other Treen supporters at the intersection. The Duke partisans that Hillier saw were more eclectic. They were skinheads that were making circles, 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 yelling in favor of Duke. There were even some frat boys that were hanging out and yelling in favor of Duke. There were, you know, teenage girls who thought he was dreamy or something, and there were TV cameras all over the place. Duke was standing in the middle of all this, delivering a gentle, soothing message. People would recognize him as they drove up, and they'd stop at the light. They'd roll down the window, and in this nice pleasant voice. Hi, I'm David Duke. I'm running to represent everybody in the district. I love everybody. And I really want to do this right. I would really appreciate your vote. A short while later, the other train supporters went to lunch. Hillier was at the intersection by himself. There was a lull in traffic. And Duke saw me. And when there was nobody else around uh, immediately to see... 
he all of a sudden made a beeline toward me and started yelling at me and snarling and his face got all red. And he said, get off of my corner. This is my street corner. There are three other corners you can go to. Get the hell out of here. And then the traffic had picked up. So he went back to the corner and people were stopped. And all of a sudden he went from this snarling red faced beast to, hi, I'm David Duke and I want to represent everybody. David Duke was desperate for every vote. John Treen just wanted the race to be over. When Hillier went back to campaign headquarters on the afternoon of Election Day, he found the candidate alone. John Treen was sitting back there looking catatonic, glassy eyes, staring straight ahead. I tried to talk to him, and he'd answer in these single syllable monotones and I, and I felt really sorry for the poor guy he he had no expectation getting into this race what he was in for and he didn't know what had hit him Trian was one of the first people I spoke to when I started working on this podcast how are you feeling how is, how's it going yeah, everything's fine <clears throat> happy 94th birthday belatedly well thank you very much it's good to be 94 <laughs> It beats the hell out of the only known alternative. <laughs> you know, a good thing about getting old is it's always easier going downhill. You knew that, didn't you? <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. And what can I do for you now? My main takeaway from interviewing Treen was that he still hated David Duke. Really, really hated him. Treen told me that Duke had spread a horrible lie about him during that 1989 race. Quinn Hillier got wind of it on election day. In addition to all the other things I heard, I distinctly remember one person going by and rolling down their window and said, no way I'm voting for your guy. He's a child molester. John Treen wasn't a child molester. His brother, Paul, was facing charges of child sexual abuse. Paul Treen would later plead no contest and be sentenced to probation. But a lot of voters thought John was the one who'd done something wrong, thanks to whispers from the Duke campaign. That smear followed Treen long after the race was over. I had people that for years later were ignored me or had things to say, ugly things to say to me because, you know, that word got out. So it was, it was a problem. If you could say something to Duke now, then what would you say? I wouldn't speak to them. I, I would have nothing to say to him. What could I say? I mean, what, what good would it do to say anything to him? Nothing. Two months after we talked, John Treen died of COVID-19. His obituary began with the race in District 81. I went to the Duke headquarters the night of the election. Uh, it was a Lions Club on Metairie Road. And the mood of the crowd was hostile, unruly. That's Jason Berry, a writer based out of New Orleans. I got in a conversation with several people who were telling me that the Holocaust was a myth, that it never happened, that six million Jews did not die. This was all a form of propaganda. I had never been exposed to Holocaust denial before that. Other journalists, who were standing in a roped-off media section, became the targets of racist abuse from Duke supporters. A black cameraman said, we need to get out of here before they lynch us. I remember I turned around and I saw a guy I had known, oh, in the eighth grade, whose sister had been a debutante in New Orleans. And when I saw that guy, I realized, you know, this is not just a bunch of... uh, of hard-edged guys with, uh, you know, shotguns in the back of their truck. There's, there's something deeper going on here. A lot of people, uh, middle class and of means, closed ranks to vote for him. After a campaign peppered with charges of racism, with unofficial returns showing 35 of 35 precincts reporting, Duke has 8,456 votes trained 8,232. We had no big political endorsements. Even the President of the United States came out against us. But we won! 
David Duke won officially by 227 votes. For the former Klansmen and the people who loved him, that narrow victory felt like a landslide. That's the crowd at Duke's election night party, recorded by Plater Robinson. Robinson was an independent radio journalist. He spent that evening circulating through the room, asking Duke's biggest fans to explain what had just happened. We don't like people who are from another area who don't know the issues and don't know the people who are involved in this political race coming down here, interfering in our politics and telling us how to vote. The most common answer Robinson heard was that Duke was going to lower taxes. We want change. We want something to be done where we have to pay less tax and get more representation in the state. And that's who we voted for David Duke, to get better representation. That's the bottom line. There was one thing these people said that didn't influence their votes. It wasn't a racial issue. It wasn't any racial issue. It's economic all the way. And and is the role of racism, is that prominent at all? Well, if the news media could uh, describe to anyone uh, a good definition of racism, uh, I certainly would like to have it. It was obvious to anyone who was paying even a scintilla of attention that a vote for Duke was a vote for the most extreme kind of prejudice. But by spending at least some of the campaign talking about taxes, Duke gave people in District 81 a cover story. He allowed them to claim that they simply liked his stands on the issues and the way he spoke his mind. Duke's plan, the one he'd explained to Evelyn Rich, had worked perfectly. When he wrapped his bigotry in conventional Republican politics, he gave his fans an excuse to vote for bigotry. Duke made himself a cause, and he made his supporters feel like members of a political family. As Duke made clear on election night, an attack on him was an attack on the whole Duke tribe. There hasn't been a campaign in modern American history where the candidate was more attacked and more slandered and more lied about and put down than, than, than you're David Duke in this election. You know that and I know that. This was a campaign of grievance and outrage, and winning one election wasn't going to change that. At that time in that room, I was really struck by how angry people were, even though the guy had won. 31 years later, John Treen had no trouble recalling how he felt that night. I remember it. And uh, actually, I broke down and cried. And one of the reasons was that it wasn't just because I lost, it was because I thought he would hurt Louisiana. And I think he did. My great-grandfather, Lewis Wright, came to the United States out of fear. He wanted to escape the rising tide of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, to find a place where he'd feel secure. Lewis ended up in the town of Eunice, Louisiana, where he opened a dry goods store in 1911. There were about 1,700 people in Eunice then. Only a handful of them were Jewish. But Lewis and his family were embraced there. Louisiana felt like home. Lewis's daughter Lillian, my grandmother, moved from Eunice to New Orleans to go to school. That's where my dad grew up and where I was born and raised. I was eight years old when Duke won that election in Jefferson Parish. I remember seeing Duke signs all over the place, including on the roof of a restaurant that served really good gumbo. I also saw Duke himself working the crowd in an LSU football game. I'd always thought that Tiger Stadium was my favorite place in the world. But after that day, I wasn't sure a Jewish kid like me belonged there or anywhere in Louisiana. Since I started out as a journalist, I've wanted the chance to look back at the Duke years and to understand why so many people were drawn to him. That feels more urgent now 
as the movement Duke built looks less like a historical oddity than a warning sign. The morning after the election in District 81, Duke said that everybody needed to calm down, that all the fears about what he might do to blacks and Jews were totally overblown. I don't know if you remember the old children's story about Chicken Little. Chicken Little ran around and said, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And it turned out it was only a small acorn on Chicken Little's head. Uh, I have been elected. I'm the new representative from this district. And ladies and gentlemen, the sky hasn't fallen. The next day, the New Orleans Times-Picayune published an editorial. It was headlined, The Duke Embarrassment. Mr. Duke's message was clearly a racial one and remained so throughout the campaign, the paper said. This message is repugnant, and we categorically reject it. At the same time, we believe every human being should be given the chance to grow, to change, to see the errors of his ways. time on Slow Burn. In 1989, David Duke made himself out to be a new man, but his years in the Klan were the key to understanding who he was and who he wanted to become. What did David Duke do for the Ku Klux Klan, and what did the Klan do for him? On episode two of our series. Slow Burn is a production of Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. This season, Slate Plus members get exclusive first access to episodes two and three of our series. Yes, if you are a member, you don't have to wait another week or two. These episodes are in your feed right now. Here's a preview. And the crowd started chanting things like boneheads, boneheads, boneheads. Um, And, you know, he didn't have to do very much to rev up these people. Their anger was there. They agreed with him. They, you know, they wanted him to do more. They would say, where are our sheets? You can listen now by signing up at slate.com slash slow burn. Starting next week, Plus members will also get weekly bonus episodes where we'll dive deeper into the history we're exploring this season. We couldn't make Slow Burn without the support of Slate Plus, so please sign up if you can. Head over to slate.com slash slow burn. Slow Burn is produced by me and Christopher Johnson, with editorial direction by Lowen Liu and Gabriel Roth. Madeline Ducharme is our production assistant. Sophie Summergrad is Slow Burn's assistant producer. Our mix engineer is Paul Mounsey. David Gross composed our theme song. The artwork for Slow Burn is by Lisa Larson Walker. Special thanks to Jordan Hirsch, Jessica Seidman, and Slate's Chow Tu, Katie Rayford, Laura Bennett, Allison Benedict, and Jared Holt. Thanks for listening.